This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here, and we're here for another episode of Core Brain Journal. And I'm going to tell you, you can't see this, folks, right now, but my socks are rolling up and down. This is going to be a very interesting meeting. And we have with us Dr. Brian Andy Farah, who is with us from North Carolina. I'm going to do a full introduction in a second. We're going to be talking about Hemingway's brain, folks, and even if you're only remotely interested in Hemingway, if you think he's, uh, you know, some kind of uh, distorted individual with bipolar illness or whatever, you're going to have you're going to have your chimes rung on this talk because this gentleman, Dr. Farah, I've read the initial part of his book on Hemingway's brain out at Amazon. You can take a look at it yourself. It's a serious piece of writing, and I'm really looking forward to talking to him. So the word from our sponsors is twofold. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention that you CB, CBJ listeners already know how much we appreciate detailed improvements of mind care. And today we're pleased to welcome a new sponsor and partner with a deep interest in fresh options to address the complexity of adolescent treatment failure nationally and international, internationally. For 80 years, the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center down here in beautiful downtown Norfolk, Virginia, provides residential care on an evolved family, interpersonal level. More about them in just a minute. And our other sponsor, you know, regarding the business of our attention to reality and data, you know how, we much, lo- how much we love laboratory data. And we love the reality. So today we're welcoming an additional clinical friend and new sponsor partner, Direct Health Access Laboratory, right outside of Chicago. And remember this about their labs, which we'll tell you more about in a minute. If they can serve professionals in Nigeria, they can certainly help you out in Fargo. Yeah, stay tuned. Okay, so let me introduce Andy Farah and say a couple words about him. He is the Chief of Psychiatry, the Medical Director at High Point Regional Health System in UNC Healthcare Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He's a board-certified psychiatrist, co-investigator of the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, groundbreaking study. Get this, folks, because we're going to have another meeting to talk to Andy about this because he is a mix of being a literary a uh, guy who's a, a really a very interesting a reporter on the uh, biography of uh, Ernest Hemingway, but he's also written a very interesting study on the correlation of clinical response with homocysteine reduction during therapy with reduced B vitamins in patients with major depressive disorder who have some genetic polymorphisms. I won't go into the details. So that is going to be another interesting one that we're going to talk about. So. For right now, we're going to talk about Ernest Hemingway. We're going to talk about every aspect. And I'm going to say on a personal note, even before we get started, Andy, uh, some of our audience know this already, but I've been er interested in Ernest Hemingway for a long time. I don't know what grabbed you. I'm looking forward to hearing what grabbed you about Hemingway and his medical illness, his psychiatric illness. But for me, it was the same thing. I I liked the guy. I liked his writing. Uh, We talked earlier several weeks ago about how we enjoyed... Uh, farewell to arms and how is it a transformational for for us and then to see what happened to him in his lifetime and to really read about his history it's it's really phenomenal so with that brief intro Andy tell us a little bit about yourself and how you started on the Hemingway path and uh, and how all that began for you Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Barnes. It's a lovely introduction, and thank you for having, you know, Core Brain Journal. I mean, it's just such a great service to clinicians, to patients, and families. So congratulations to you. And you. Yeah, this is really, I'm so glad you're a fan, and it's so exciting um, to, to get this notice. You know, you work on these things for years in silence, and you don't know how it's 
coming out or how people are going to accept it. But you're absolutely right. You know, years ago, I just got out of, I uh, shouldn't say years ago, I got out of residency in the late 90s, right? <laughs> and um, there was a wonderful gentleman named Bill Smallwood. He was one of the Hemingway biographers, but his emphasis was the last 10 years of Hemingway's life. And of course, uh, in Idaho, he co-wrote the Idaho Hemingway. And of course, he wanted to know, you know, he, he sought me out. I had done research on shock therapy, ECT. And he wanted to meet someone who knew about ECT, with, and he had two questions. One was, why did Hemingway decline and not improve with his ECT? Because he had read that 90% of people get a cure when they get their shock therapy. And the second question was, what would you do for him today? And so we had a lovely dinner, a lovely man, and I said, you know, the, um, the patients that we do ECT with who decline rather than improve, what that usually indicates is they have some form of organic brain disease and it was yet to be diagnosed but the ECT was that biological stressor that sort of propelled it or at least brought it out sort of like when grandmother goes in the hospital with a hip fracture and suddenly now her dementia shows up and the, the family says well she didn't have dementia before she came in why do you say she has Alzheimer's now and you have to explain well the hip fracture the anesthesia the medical stress was a biological stressor on the system that now she's ripped out of her environment and now the dementia is manifest and so I, he said, well, what would that, you know, biological stressor have been for, you know, that underlying organic disease for which the biological stressor was ECD, what was that organic, you know, illness for Hemingway? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me read your book. And, and I, I, it was fascinating. I read all the biographies I could. I started reading the memoirs and the letters. And, it, and, and frankly, you know, shortly into that endeavor, you know, I put the pieces together and I was really surprised that no one else had. It just seemed to me very, very obvious uh, what was going on with this, uh, with this gentleman and uh, this genius, actually, this man who redefined modernism and re pretty much shaped uh, literary history of the 20th century. It was very obvious to me, you know, what had happened. Here's a man who suffered nine major concussions in his life, both blast type injuries and direct blows to his head, and who had untreated diabetes and hypertension uh, for most of his adult life. Uh, so we have an individual that by the time he received his shock therapy, you know, then for psychosis, for depression, sure, but he had a form of dementia. Predominantly, it was chronic traumatic encephalopathy, just like, you know, our football players have today. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was other, there was probably a vascular component. There was probably an alcoholic component, but the ECT was that biological stressor on that system that he could not handle either from a psychiatric, from a psychological standpoint, because of course the memory deficits were accentuated and he felt he could not work, or from a physiological standpoint, and it sort of propelled that dementia. So that's how I got interested. And of course, like you, I was a fan of the, um, you know, of the fictional works. Um, and I always remember when I was uh, in high school reading, I think, Ten Indians, where there was this lovely line where the little boy Nick has learned that his girlfriend, you know, has been sort of off with somebody else, <laughs> right? So so he, he wakes up the next morning, and there's this lovely line where it says he was awake a long time before he remembered that his heart was broken. And you think, mm. you know, that's a beautiful line, you mm. know, being this, you know, like 12-year-old, 13-year-old boy, and you, you remember what it was like to decide what your emotions would be and have your little heart broken. Um, and I think that for me, I, I, I think Hemingway's sensitivity and his genius in that, you know, in that observation, that awareness, I mean, he's even been compared to Proust in that sense, that articulation of perception, you know, but, but people get confused by the persona. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, the persona kind of distracts from the incredible sensitivity of the genius, you know. Uh, so again, it was that lovely um, combination of my two passions, the literature uh, and the uh, psychiatric demise uh, that, uh, that, that propelled me to, to just pursue this work. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't realize that he had had nine Very concussions. Fun. I. I had some number in my mind because I'd done a very right. superficial level of studying because I was, I knew that the electroshock had been damaging to him, and I had been talking about. It. I did a presentation probably right. um, several years ago, like ten years ago, saying, you know, if we're missing mm -hmm. the fact that electroshock does this to a person who's already brain damaged, and I think I came up with about four concussions. The right. uh, airplane accident in Africa, the running on the jeep outside of Paris after the Germans wow. were out, and then, uh, and then you filled me in. Uh, there were there were a couple of others, but and then you filled me in. Boom, boom, boom. You have a number of them. <laughs> 
on your mind because you did such careful work. Let's since yeah. we're on the subject of brain injury itself, and since it's such right. an absolutely relevant, Andy, you may not know this, but we've got mm -hmm. a whole page on Core Brain Journal just for vets because we're so interested yeah. in what happens with. And of course, he was a vet. He was a guy coming right. back from the war who had a number of uh, incidents occur. And I'm anyway. If you would tell us a little bit about that, because brain injury is is something we're all interested in here. You're right. It's very, very timely. And you're right. You, you name, you know, most people knew Hemingway had injuries, but you're absolutely right. As far as the exact number, we know he um, boxed as a youth, boxed throughout most of his adult life. We know he played high school in football. And in fact, in The Sun Also Rises, he talks about, you know, being knocked out by the boxer Cohen. And he describes it, it being like when he was at a football game and being kicked in the head early in the game and everything was far off and he would take steps and they said, like they were coming from far off. So he, he had no um, problem describing post-concussive syndrome in, in literature or in letters. I, I kind of went through his selected letters and, and the three volumes of the collected letters and just put like little sticky notes in the margins every time I saw him mention post-concussive symptoms or name the word concussion in his letters. It was like seven notes, you know, and I haven't even gotten through the end of the book. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. The first concussion, you know, we know that concussive injury, whether it's a blast wave injury from an explosion or a direct blow, we know we have the diffuse axonal injury. So we have the axon shearing, tearing, ripping, breaking, leading to, of course, an inflammatory response, cytokines release, intracellular contents release. Uh, and the damage that occurs um, will ob obviously happen weeks uh, later, months later, years later. In fact, the, um, to go from post-concussive syndrome to chronic traumatic encephalopathy takes about 10 years, right? So mm -hmm. people can have a concussion and 10 years later have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But the important thing, you're right, the blast injury in World War I for Hemingway was critical because this... Um you know, it was he's on the Austrian uh, front. He, he, a five-gallon mortar explodes, kills two men between him and the bomb, uh, and it throws him several feet, knocks him unconscious. So we have this blast wave injury. And what's important about that concussion, he's a young man, and that bodes well. You know, people who are younger do better. But we know that, you know, 20% of uh, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan do have post-concussive symptoms uh, from blast wave, you know, the IUDs. This is a blast wave injury, not a direct blow injury. But that was the first concussive injury for Hemingway. So we might still be having this discussion, even if that were the only one <laughs> that he suffered. Uh, but, the, you know, of course, he uh, roused himself, uh, so the legend goes. He carried another wounded man, uh, covered himself in blood with that man's uh, uh, wounds, of course. He gets to the, uh, he passes out. He's hit with machine gun bullets. So he has multiple injuries. Uh, by the time he gets to the dugout, you know, a Florentine priest administers first rights because he thinks he's dead. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that was his first concussive injury in World War I. Uh, by World War II, um, well, well, actually, a lot happened in between. Um, in the Paris years, 1928, he's gone out drinking with his buddy Archie McLeish, and they come in at 2 in the morning, uh, and, and Hemingway goes to the restroom. Instead of pulling the cord for the commode, he, he mixes it up with a cord for the skylight, and it's already been broken. Anyway, he pulls a skylight out of the ceiling from 12 feet high and knocks himself in the head, gives himself another concussion. Mm. Uh, and of course, that uh, the taste of blood, the giddy ramblings, all that stuff I describe in the book, he, he winds up um, writing Farewell to Arms, you know, right after that. And Is he, that he wrote right? to his. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, it was sort of rekindled the memories from World War One, and he he wrote to his editor that his wife is going to see that she makes sure he bleeds as often as he can write because it's been going so well, you know. So uh, so that's number concussion number two. Now we zoom ahead, um, and now we're in London at the time of the Blitz, and everything is blacked out, and he's out partying with uh, Robert Coppa at his apartment at Leicester Square, gets in a car with another gentleman who is uh, intoxicated. They're both intoxicated, but they chose the drug. Driver. They said, well, you're no drunker than me. You get to drive. Imagine saying that. Well, you're no drunker than Hemingway. You get to drive. Mm -hmm. And so they plow into a water tower because it was everything was blacked out and they couldn't turn their headlights on. So his head goes into the windshield. His Cuban doctor after that said, you know, I think you had all the symptoms of a subdural hematoma. Who knows? You know, we had no MRIs then or CT scans then. But he clearly had another concussion, 57 stitches across the frontal area again. Now he's got a concussion talking about, you know, the D-Day landings. 
Higgins. He was too valuable an asset to be there with the first wave, but he was able to get in the Higgins boats and see the latter waves. But he talked about how hard it was to climb in and out of the riggings and in and out of the boats with the uh, headache and the dizziness and the disequilibrium that goes with concussion. So at any rate, so he... Um, He's he's fur, he's in France now, and you're absolutely right. There's this incident where he and Robert Kopp are on an ill-advised mission. He's in the sidecar of a motorbike. A German anti-tank they come around a corner, and they don't see the Germans, of course, until it's too late. An anti-tank round blows Hemingway out of the sidecar, and he hits his head on a boulder. So in that concussive injury, he's not only had a blast injury, but he has the direct blow injury. Mm-hmm. So he's got two in one there. And then you reference this is a very clever view to reference his letter for. For call years, when he was a reporter, he's talking about going in to liberate France, and he's in a, a German 88 round, this is an anti aircraft round, blows him out of a Jeep. So he says, now we don't know, uh, he says he hit the deck, uh, the Jeep's locked bumpers. Uh, nobody else could verify this. It could be a Hemingway tall tale. So we know there's at least two concussive injuries uh, there after that uh, car wreck in London, maybe a third. Um, so now we zoom ahead in Cuba, he falls on his fishing boat, another car accident. In Cuba, he goes into the windshield, and, and of course, to seal the deal, we have those two plane crashes in Africa in 1954. Uh, Mary Hemingway is wanting to photograph the Murchison Falls. They're in a plane, and the, the, there's a flock of ibis that, that dives in front of the plane, so the pilot has to swerve. He hits some telegraph wires, and they crash. Now, this wasn't such a bad crash, but they're... Um, they're out in the open. Uh, you know, they have to spend the night in the open. Uh, uh, anyway, the bottom line is a bunch of elephants are kind of curious because Hemingway snores through the night, and they want to trample on over and see what's going on, and Mary has to keep waking him up to stop the snoring so the elephants go away. Anyway, the next morning, another plane has spotted them, a twin-engine de Havilland. Uh, it, it, um, it does pick them up. It's going to take them to safety, they think. They climb into this plane. But it, unfortunately, the runway, it's not really a, a runway. It's a, it's a field that's badly plowed and so the pilot on the, of this plane he crashes on takeoff so the the, this is a more violent and fiery crash the cockpit is filling with smoke uh the um pilot kicks out the front windows, Roy Marsh, and um, or Cartwright. Cartwright's the second pilot. He pulls Mary out. Hemingway's too big to get out the front windows, so he, the door is jammed. He's injured his shoulder from the first crash, so he very unwisely busts open the door with his head. He gives himself a basal or skull fracture and another concussion. So it was mm-hmm. after that second plane crash that his friends really noticed that his his uh, cognition was different. You know, His memory was deteriorating. Mm-hmm. His, his speech was different. His handwriting was different. So at that point, it's very clear that there was some chronic traumatic encephalopathy taking hold. In addition, of course, to chronic drinking and the untreated diabetes and hypertension. So a man in his mid-50s had these, um, you know, these multiple concussive blows. And, uh, you know, the, the importance, I think, I emphasize in the book there, the blast wave injuries, which are certainly significant, and, the, you know, the, the boxing and such. I mean, those are chronic sub-threshold. They're not sub-concussive blows, but a, an accumulation of them can have the same effect. So I believe that you see the effects of this in the writing. I think you see it in the personality. I I was asked by uh, Linda Miller, a famous Hemingway scholar, she said, what did this, what impact did these concussions have on the persona? And I said, you know, come to think of it, if you read the biographies, the concussive injuries seem to solidify the very worst aspects of the persona. Mm -hmm. We have patients who have concussive injury and, you know, and they have post-concussive syndrome, CTE, and so forth. They get irritable, aggressive, volatile, you know, poor judgment. Well, that was Hemingway in his last decade. So it seemed that when people say, well, he was trapped in the persona, he was behaving the way people expected him to behave, I think he was incapable organically of breaking out of that mode. I think Mm -hmm. it was just sort of, at that point, it was an organically derived pathology. It was kind of a a post-concussive depersonalization. I mean, right, right. Yeah, I think one. His real self, he was. And then you wrote so well in the uh, introduction about his uh, grandiosity, his trying Mm -hmm. to live within the persona that he had created, which was, in a certain respect, trying to find the reality of himself again based on the fact that he was so disconnected with himself. 
Right. You, you stated beautifully in the word depersonalization because, uh, you know, one, one author described it as a spy who had been out uh, too long and sort of believed his own cover. And, and that's, a, that's a good psychological explanation. But I think we have, like you say so well, an organic explanation for this depersonalization and, and this acting out the role. Well, it's kind of what he was doing organically. Mood swings, volatility, irritability, violence with Mary, you know, and, and, and people said, well, he's just, that's just him. And it's, well, you know, what they miss is that as a young man, we're talking about a very exquisitely sensitive, observant man, you know, mm-hmm. who was not, you know, not, not at all the, um, the, the boisterous sort of, uh, you know, persona that we see in the older age, you know. Well, the other thing that occurs to me is the the whole business, and you said it so well, about the misidentification of him by saying that he was bipolar. And and you said it so very well in the introduction. Uh, I didn't remember it enough to quote you, but I thought you said it very well because I think it's something we all struggle with, those who are... Uh, attempting to move the science forward and thinking about the innovations that have taken place with the advancement of technology and the real full understanding of of these uh, real biologic entities that occur that that cause behavioral changes. And you said it so well. It's just that, hey, they just, Uh I don't remember exactly what you said. Maybe you recall it. It wasn't that they were ignorant. It's that they were still living in the darkness. Right. It wasn't medical, you know, mismanagement. It was just misunderstanding. You know, in mm-hmm. fact, in 1961, when Hemingway himself was presenting to Mayo Clinic with classic chronic traumatic encephalopathy, you know, there was a pivotal, it was a very important article in British Journal of Psychiatry. It was called Accident Neuroses. It said all these patients who have these car accidents, days before seatbelts, of course, and the seatbelts, you no know, seatbelts, no airbags, and these people were having concussions. And this psych- famous psychiatrist said, look, if these patients have car accidents and they come in with all these weird symptoms like disequilibrium and mood swings and memory deficit. It's called accident neuroses. They're just looking for attention. They're looking for money. It's a form of psychogenic illness. And what's ironic about that is Hemingway himself described dementia pugilistica in the boxer of Ad Francis, who is a uh, kind of a conglomerate. There was a there was a boxer named Ad Woolgast, another one named Oscar Battling Nelson, and these are early you know 20th century boxers who were oh, just well known for their ability to take punishment, and unfortunately, they developed chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which was called dementia pugilistica. So he wrote about that as a very young man. Uh, He wrote The Battler. Actually, he wrote that story to kind of replace the very um, uh, unpublishable story up in Michigan, which is a story of a date rape, of course. But at any rate, he he understood CTE, and he actually developed it. It was very prescient and very strange. Of course, he didn't know what he was writing at the time. Um, So even though he, you know, he was a head of medical science. It's not the first time. You know, he had um, these uh, lovely characters, right? Brett Ashley, Margot McComber, and Catherine Bourne are three of his most famous female characters. And the myth is that Hemingway didn't didn't understand women or didn't write about women. So he wrote beautifully about women as long as they had borderline personality disorder. <laughs> and those are classic. If you look at Brett Ashley, Margot McComber, and, and Catherine Bourne, they are textbook examples of borderline personalities, which make for great literature, you know, because they're volatile and they're, you know, hypersexual and they're, you know, whatever they are. But the bottom line is here he was predicting another psychiatric illness before we would codify it in 1980 in DSM. So so he really was a very brilliant and sensitive guy. But you're absolutely right that at the time he presented with his symptoms, nobody really had the awareness to know, you know, the guy comes in in 1960, 1961 with delusional beliefs and depression and suicidal, well, you give him shock therapy. You know, mm-hmm. you think he's psychotic depression. You don't dig deeper, and, and that was probably the only explanation they needed. Again, he got standard of, standard of care, of standard state-of-the-art therapy just for the wrong illness, not for the right illness. Well, right. that was still the standard of care, and you know more about uh, electroencephalol, uh, you know, e- ECT than yeah. I do, uh, electroconvulsive yeah. therapy, but when I was a kid in my first year of residency in 1969, uh, that was still a standard of care. I was working in a state hospital outside of Philadelphia. And, right. Um, you know, it's just what we did. And I was on the acute ward, and uh, the people there were very effective at helping people who were very acutely disturbed, psychotic, even paranoid. 
right. put them in and, and give them ECT and uh, would yeah. turn them around temporarily. I mean, who knew who knew at that time what was causing those symptoms because the idea of having some kind of biologic appreciation of what, what could be going on in the person's mind was very far. I mean, that was the, those were the days of psychoanalysis when psychoanalysis was, right. was in its heyday. And right. You know, an ECT worked. I mean, it generally, if you have depression or psychosis, it generally it broke catatonia, it broke mania, you know, broke psychosis. In fact, Hemingway's son Gregory had more shock therapy than Hemingway did, and his son Patrick had it as well. Uh, so it was standard of care. I think the movies have sort of um, made it very unpalatable, right, because you have the cuckoo's nest. Most people remember that ECT mm -hmm. was a punitive measure, and they conflated it with frontal lobotomies, which were not. That wasn't us. Right, that wasn't psychiatrist. That was neurology, mm -hmm. a neurology guy propagating that. And then you have the beautiful mind, where they conflated sort of insulin coma with ECT. Uh, and in fact, um, yes, twenty percent of people who did get insulin coma therapy had seizures, and therefore it had kind of the therapeutic effect of ECT. So that's why it stuck around, even though it, without the seizure, it wasn't therapeutic. You know, and I always tell people, you know, Hemingway did not have the monopoly on mental illness when it comes to the lost generation. We have. Ezra Pound, who has spent his life as an untreated bipolar. We have um, T.S. Eliot, who, who was so neurotic that he couldn't pass an army physical due to anxiety, but he married a schizophrenic. Uh, well, at least she's believed to be schizophrenic, but I think in the early uh, 20th century, if you were a histrionic young lady, they gave you bromide and you would hallucinate, right? It's just like Evelyn Waugh had. Mm -hmm. We know um, Zelda Fitzgerald was uh, schizoaffective, mm -hmm. probably. We know F Scott Fitzgerald was an alcoholic. And in this famous letter, Scott said, uh, you know, people think uh, she's crazy because I drink, and they think I drink because she's crazy. <laughs> you know? And so he would just had this reciprocal, um, and he was so uh, in denial. He said, well, you know, her hallucinations are uh, wonderful to me. And, you know, it's just, are you kidding? This is a very tortured life. You know, James Joyce had a, a daughter who was schizophrenic, and it tormented him. She even had Carl Jung as a therapist, but of course, talk therapy doesn't help much with schizophrenia. Uh, so uh, that's what's fascinating to me when I got into this, was that the lost generation itself had lots of psychopathology. I'm not much into the whole, uh, I'm more um, the Paris group, not the Bloomsbury group, but of course, the Virginia Woolf has been extensively studied uh, in that group as well. So. well but you, you're right. Uh, yeah. You mentioned Ezra Pound. I mean, uh, yeah. I was yeah. totally fascinated with Ezra pound for a long period of time i got i the the, the peas and cantos were uh, a big transformational yes. story for me the guy in the cage out there uh yes when the hoar frost grips thy tent thou will note when the night is spent yes <laughs> something it's like such that. a it's an amazing story, isn't it? Because Ezra Pound, of course, is a, an American original. He's a, clearly a genius. And he he's sort of the manet to the impressionist. You know, like he was sort of that role to the lost and read. A little older, more experienced. You know, he was he got Ulysses published. He got The Wasteland published. Uh, he mentored Hemingway. You know, so here's the, 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 the grandfather of the lost generation. Now, mm -hmm. what we... What we know about him is the the political problems that he was an anti Semite, he was anti American. So then in the nineteen forties he says, Well night late nineteen thirties he says, Well, I'm a fascist, I support Mussolini. Now who in the world, you know, would do that? And the only thing that explains it, if you read his biographies, it's so clear to me that he clearly had sort of this, he's one of those bipolar patients that spent his life in a hype, 5% of bipolars spend their life in a hypomanic episode. And they're about to mania, fine, and, and maybe not so much depression, but the, their baseline is hypomania. And if you look at his production, um, you know, in nonfiction, fiction, so forth. But you also look at the, just the, the the loose associations and so forth. But the problem is, he's a genius, you know, mm -hmm. so he can write this elegant stuff and people are kind of thinking, well, may, you know, he's just eccentric. So you have this elegant production in the face of this hypomania and bouts of mania. So, of course, by the time, you know, the uh, Allies are in control of Italy, he gets arrested for treason. He's put in Pisa, uh, the, the DTC, the Disciplinary Training Camp, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, is where the military 
military houses, most recalcitrant rapists, murders, the worst criminals, and they had even death cells. were basically concrete bunkers in the ground that, you know, you drop somebody in and two weeks later pull up their corpse. But Pound was put in a basically a dog kennel, a 10 by 10, you know, a 10 by 10 foot dog kennel with a sloped roof. He, had, he was exposed to the elements. Uh, he was already hypomanic, quasi-psychotic, and of course this, this continual, he had a heat stroke, he developed psychosis, uh, they caged him uh, basically for a month, and then he finally goes to the medical um, area, and he's able to, at this point, recover and writes the Peace and Cantos. And it's a beautiful study. I mean, the, the Peace and Cantos, like you say, they're beautiful. They're amazing. But you, you put this brain, this genius brain, in this crucible of torment, uh, not only from the elements, but from the, his own illness and his own delusion. And, and what comes out the other end when he finally recovers are these this elegant Peace and Cantos. And it's, like I said, I've read those dozens of times like you. They're just amazing. But I think the lesson is we have this 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 gentleman who spends 12 years in St. Elizabeth's, right? And they still don't give him mm-hmm. lithium. Or you know, mm-hmm. Later in his life, he got some amitriptyline, <laughs> but nothing really therapeutic. Mm-hmm. And so they were always missing the mark with this poor guy. Uh, so uh, the other interesting thing about pound studies is that you have these incredible, you have pay to Yuma, you have these journals dedicated to every little tangent he went on. These are tangents of a bipolar mind, you know, uh, but so that every little thing he said, every mythological illusion, well, it was just a loose association. It doesn't mean you go down that rabbit hole or this rabbit hole, mm-hmm. but at any rate, yeah, pound was an amazing, amazing character. And as, and if you talk about mental illness and, and the lost generation, I mean, he, he kind of trumps Hemingway as far as the pathology goes. Hemingway himself, you know, said that Pound, you know, he deserves sympathy and we need to, you know, he's very sick and he saw his mind warping and twisting. In fact, um, there's the famous story where he wanted, where Joyce had him over for dinner and he wanted Hemingway to come. He says, I just, you know, he was wacky. We just didn't know what he would do. Uh, so he wanted Hemingway to come to kind of keep an eye on Pound. Uh, but, but yet what shines through is this incredible uh, literature. And of course, now I think that, that what's lost on people People, people want to conflate, you know, bipolar with creativity. Well, sure. I mean, if you're hypomanic and you're reasonably sane, you can produce. But I think that the um, the vast majority of people who are sick to that degree, they just, you know, to, to sit down and write like a Hemingway or a Pound, you can't do that when you're ill. I think Robert Lowell is a classic example of a poet who had classic bipolar illness. But when he was acutely manic, I mean, he's standing in the traffic in New York, trying to stop the traffic, thinking he's the Holy Ghost, so he can't, but that's not conducive to writing great poetry. It's only after, when he recovers, that he uses those experiences. Uh, And same thing with Hemingway as his brain demented. You know, the tool he needed to create these incredible works was was simply de- deteriorating. I think I used the example in one of my lectures of um, Hills Like White Elephants. You know, we, those four beautiful words, we all know what it means. We may have written essays about it. But, you know, that was 83 words, four paragraphs, and he distilled and distilled. And it's just writing poetry so that you can take those, you know, that incredible, um, you know, concept and just Still it down to this this phrase that we all know what it means, and even now we debate there's beautiful literature about well, did she have the abortion or did she choose her man and keep the baby you know mm-hmm. with that wonderful phrase hills like white elephants and so to do that kind of brain work, it takes cognition, and that's what was suffering and I think you alluded early on in our discussion how no one could really imitate Hemingway like Hemingway, and the the works did suffer later on because of that dementia, but thank goodness. Thank you for mentioning Ezra Pound. He's one of my favorites as well, <laughs> from a literary and psychiatric standpoint. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, one of the things is we were talking, and I just happened to notice the time, so I'm going to take a quick break here to yeah. uh, have a moment for our sponsors to weigh in and say a little bit uh, about them for a minute. And then we'll come right back. I've got a question for you, Andy, about yeah. transcendence and brain injury. We'll talk about that yeah. in just a second. So Sounds we'll be good. right back. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, 
should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families including military families internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living. How do we know we refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing? So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's dhalab.com forward slash core. So, okay, we're back, folks, and we'll just get right on it. I want to tell you, Andy, this is a great conversation. I can't tell you how much I enjoy speaking with you. And I am going to absolutely love your book because I love the way you write. I love the way you talk, the references that you're bringing up. You're so interestingly well-educated in terms of the things of things that have been fascinating for me, interesting for me for my entire lifetime. So this is a real value and a real pleasure for me. You're so kind, and like I say, when when you fell in love, I fell in love with modernism when I was in high school. When I was assigned uh, "Farewell to Arms," and I remember, no, it was actually "For Whom the Bell Tolls." That was the first one, mm-hmm. and I remember going to my dad because I just said, "Dad, you got to tell me what is, what's this Spanish Civil War? I don't understand. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys?" I remember my dad, who was a World War II veteran, he just like he had no answer, and I'm like, "This is the first time <laughs> this man has no answer," mm-hmm. and it's sort of like now when my little boy comes to me and says. Hey, what's going on in Syria? I'm like, gosh, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? I don't know. Uh, but I remember putting, uh, yeah, th- that became a passion. Then I just said, well, I got to figure this stuff out. You know, this is well, good I, work. I think but... it does invite a person living life on any level to really think about the meaning of conflict and, and, and ways yeah. to transcend it. I mean, conflict is yeah. so ubiquitous. I mean, argue arguments with you know, people you love all the way to world war. I mean, all of it, right. we, we search for solutions to it and ways to actually transcend it. And while we were speaking about poetry, the question I wanted to ask you, which is obviously not prepared at all, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd be interested in no your problem. thoughts about it. Sure. It, one of the things that occurs to me that uh, I was thinking about with uh, Ezra Pound and with Hemingway and the brain injuries and the and the illnesses they had was when they were sick, when they were in that serious level of um, confusion and emotional pain, that Mm -hmm. they were seeking with their brains. The brain was a tool to try to put something together. And and it has a certain measure of painful transcendence that takes you out of the ordinary because the ordinary doesn't have any answers. Just as you were saying on your story with your father and and the Middle East. I mean, there's no mm-hmm. the ordinary has no answers. The the answer yes. has to be in a, in a, in some other dimension that that perhaps we can't appreciate because of our limited view of our lives and our and our time on this earth. Yes. 
You you nailed it. Um, you absolutely nailed it. You know, it's it's um, it's uncanny you bring that up because I always when people asked Hemingway, you know, do you see a, a therapist? He'd say, well, my my typewriter is my therapist. And what he meant by that was that the act of working, you know, the act of typing out a manuscript and an idea was the, was his therapy. And he would admonish, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, why are you belly aching? You need to get to work. Work is your therapy, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But what we know now is that um, you know that that the process of, of of you know writing farewell to arms, writing sun also rises, writing you know what he wrote. In fact, take the example of uh, my old man, the story he wrote, my old man. This is this is right after his father's suicide and right after the suicide of his first girlfriend, Prudy Bolton, the little Indian girl he used to hang out with and and was a little honey with as a teenager in the Michigan woods. So they both committed suicide. Prudy Bolton at age sixteen when she got pregnant by an older man and. His father, of course, shot himself with the Colt pistol carried by his father in the Civil War. And so Hemingway's writing Mile Man is the most Joycean story. You know, he has this the stream of consciousness reminiscing and very overt sexual content. And so he's processing it. And I think that's the amazing thing about Hemingway's scholarship now is we're all so used to looking backwards and saying, aha, this is an incidence where, um, you know, it, it reflects something that's happening in his life. It comes out in his fiction. Now look going forward. He has done the therapy. He's done the work of processing, you know, this through the fiction. Now look how it informs his life, you know, going forward. So you're absolutely right as far as the transcendent nature of these great literary works. You know, John Locke said that we have a a great science of matter and motion. We just don't have a science of the mind. Now he's writing this (laughs) centuries ago, and he's absolutely right. Like you and I, our profession now, we people come to us and we say we're going to block this neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter, and you. I'll have residents come to me and say, okay, patient's been depressed, they've been on Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Selexa, Brentelix, and they won't tell me, they'll tell me this beautiful neuropsych presentation, but never tell me why the person is depressed, you know? So the reality is... Yeah, I mean, so and, and and the sad thing is, our profession has become so organic and so neurochemical and so receptor based that we've forgotten about the mind. And I'm one of the I'm old enough to have been trained by really good, you know, psychotherapists. And I think that the transcend our 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 minds argue for the transcendent nature of our being. You know, I tell people that you know we're just talking about the hardware. You know, when you, it's like turning on the radio and you hear Mozart. Well, the you know the Mozart's not coming from the radio. That's coming from somewhere else. The radio is just the tool, and the brain is just the tool of that which is transcendent. And so all we're talking about, we're talking about the brushes Caravaggio used. We're not talking about the Caravaggio, you know, the painting itself. We're just talking about what was his pigment and what were his brushes. And so once you realize that, it's very, very humbling. But you also realize that in the latter works of Hemingway, so here he is, you know, as, as a man who's losing his cognitive ability to convey this, but you see the beauty of these uh, works just trying to, you know, come through. The, if you look at the posthumous works like the um, the Garden of Eden or the Africa Journal or Islands in the Stream, you see the same archetypes kind of coming through. But the the you know even to some extent immovable feast, the technical skill uh, was lacking because the tool with which it was being conveyed, you know, is is being broken. And I spent a lot of time in the book talking about Willem de Kooning because de Kooning is this amazing abstract expression. And he's he's similar to Hemingway in the superficial way that you see these sort of cartoony women or you see something cartoony on the surface of his paintings. But below it is this layering and layering of beauty and complexity, just like Hemingway. You know, okay, a man catches a fish or a man blows up a bridge or soldiers march down the field or whatever. That's the superficial story. But behind it is the layering and complexity. Hemingway himself said they were the the three (laughs) shots. You know, he, he says, yeah, there's the superficial. Official, there's the next layer of you know what's not being said, and there's the mythological illusion. And now it's very common now to understand Hemingway like we understand Joyce, you know, someone who um, is is bringing in mythological and religious uh, references and illusions that are just not obvious. That Hemingway is you know Joyce is the only person. Well, first of all, you know um, Hemingway and Joyce were friends, and Joyce read Hemingway manuscripts. It's the only person he did that for. Uh, and they were they basically are writing about the same thing. Um, you know, there was a Hemingway critic who stood up about 30 years ago and said, you know, if you look at Farewell to Arms, you, Ulysses, you have the male leaving the Martello Tower, 
You have the man leaving, you know, the company of men. He seeks the surrogate father, you know, Bloom and Daedalus versus uh, Rinaldi and the priest and so forth and, and uh, Frederick Henry. Then you have him seeking the woman. You, ha- you know that uh, with uh, um, Bloom, he, doesn't ha- he, he can't be intimate with uh, Molly because of the death of their son. We know that Frederick Henry's son dies at childbirth and his wife dies. He said, this is the same story. Ulysses and Farewell to Arms are the same. It's the same archetype. And people mm. literally laughed at him. <laughs> and yet he's absolutely right That's... that Hemingway is a student of Joyce and has the identical. And, and later on, we see this, these uh, mythological. And I think that, you know, the, the beautiful thing about that is it may not be conscious. I think that, uh, you know, when you mm-hmm. read, um, um, you know, Stuart Gilbert's work on, um, uh, you know, Ulysses, where he talks, he directly talks to James Joyce and says, is this the, the illusion you were referring to? Uh, he never, never wants to say, was it conscious or unconscious? I think it can be unconscious. But I think that's, that's the importance of the CTE, the dementia that Hemingway suffered, was that he tried very hard. I think the mythological underpinnings were there, just like an abstract expressionist, whatever impulse is driving them, they're trying to do the same creative work, but they just can't. The technique, the, the ability to convey is gone with the dementing brain in, in Hemingway's case. Whereas in de Kooning's case, who had vascular, severe vascular dementia, well, he could simply, uh, you know, he could paint. And he used primary colors, and he, he did some nice works. But So his impulse was not as conscious as Hemingway. It didn't require the cognitive processing. It was a subconscious impulse uh, that he couldn't convey through basal ganglia and learn memory. He couldn't convey those archetypes, whereas Hemingway couldn't, you know. Well, one of the things so, that both of us like, this is so darn interesting. I'm looking forward to talking yeah. to you about major depressive disorder, too, because yeah, you're, sure, you're really sure. adding uh, such an interesting dimension to the conversation. You know, but oh, I wonder so this kind. question. This is going to be something... Me, I the whole thing with core brain journal is to get away from speculation, okay? I think we're speculating, right. and one of the reasons we speculate so often in psychiatry is because the whole standard of care is based on reductionistic thinking, and that's the end point. That's not where we start that's where we're going i mean that's our mission to find out that diagnosis i mean is it hyperactive or inattentive you know and (laughs) it's just so completely dumbs down the human experience i mean who wants to see a psychiatrist if they're going to be dumbed down you know right uh, it's cookie cutter yeah yeah it's it's a big cookie cutter world and and we're the global thought leaders on cookie cutter thinking Unfortunately, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I yeah. so appreciate this conversation. But now let me ask you it's a speculative so point yeah. because, yeah. you know, one of the things that occurred to me, and I've I've thought about this a lot because I was thinking, what would have happened to Hemingway mm-hmm. if? And I'm talking, I'm put your psychiatric hat on here for a little bit, and it's yes. speculation, but we're we're, yes. we're just reviewing this a little bit. What would happen if he didn't have now the? My recollection was it was about 25 shock treatments at Mayo. Was that it? Do you remember? Correct, yeah. That's about right. Between two admissions, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what would have happened to Hemingway if he didn't have that amount of shock therapy? I wonder I wonder what would have right. happened. Because honestly, I've got this secret wish to go in and correct him. You know, I, I had right. this thing, okay, now I've worked in addiction medicine for many years. I was certified in addiction medicine. So I kind of have that piece together, Psychopharma- psychopharmacology. I'm really kind of also asking on a personal level, what would you have done? I, you know, I asked myself right. the question, what would I have done if I had a chance out there in Ketchum and I told you before offline, I've been to his grave, we've been out in Ketchum and in Sun Valley and, and see that whole experience and, and the wonderful writing that he had on an obituary on a rock out there to a friend who right. passed away. But anyway, back to it. So what would you have done differently? What, what would you have done to try to turn Hemingway around if you had a shot at him? You're absolutely, that's a great question. Um, You know, certainly, so you have a gentleman who comes to you with, you know, uh, people have asked me, is he an alcoholic? Well, fine. You know, he was a functional alcoholic, and he's the alcoholic in the spirit of Churchill, who said, I have taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me, (laughs) right? (laughs) Uh, uh, And and he famously said, you know, a life without alcohol is like driving a race car without motor oil. And he also said famously that it's hard to take boards without alcohol. 
life is boring without alcohol. It's hard to take bores without alcohol, and so forth. So it was part of the persona, part of the image. Uh, I think he's one of those guys. You know, I've met people. You met people. We just know, yeah, the. The, the, you can't detox them. You detox them, they're going to go back to do something. And I remember I had an attending uh, in residency who, who had a patient come in every six months for his Valium. He said, if I get this guy Valium, he doesn't drink, and uh, it saves his liver. And, and so I give him 20 of Valium a day, and he doesn't do alcohol. And I thought, well, okay, that's the rare case. So someone like Hemingway, when he was told he had to take two glasses of wine a day, he could cut down. So I think we would subtract one of the offending agents. We'd say, okay, here's that as a Pam, or here's a couple glasses of wine a day, and that's your limit. Now, exercise, moderate exercise, uh, mm -hmm. and then um, keeping the brain active, of course, you know, the classical music through the night so that the brain waves are still going even though you're asleep. And of course, you know, they took away his reserpine, which was causing more depression. That was a great, an antihypertensive known to deplete serotonin. Uh, he was also at times taking secanol. We would take that away. We would take away the high dose. Uh, you know, he took Ritalin. It's sometimes not a bad idea. He took testosterone. Not a bad idea. Uh, again, nothing consistent. Uh, high doses of vitamin A and vitamin E because he thought one would help his eyesight, the other would help libido. I would replace those with vit B vitamins, of course, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about. So I think there would have been things to do, and I think he would have had a longer life. I don't think he would have ended in such a tragic end. Uh, but, you know, the funny thing about suicide for him, you know, he believed, you know, there's this wonderful, well, not wonderful, I guess a tragic story, uh, where he, he he's in his 40s, late 40s, he's writing to Mary about his grandfather Hall, who had Bright's disease, which I think was a form of kidney inflammation, mm -hmm. probably kidney stones, or probably kidney infection back mm -hmm. then, and uh, very painful, and, and the man wanted to kill himself and so he puts his pistol under the bed, and Hemingway's father, Clarence Edmonds Hemingway, took the bullets out so that the old man, the grandfather, you know, the father of his his wife, of his, his you know, Clarence's wife, you know, pulls the trigger and nothing happens. And Hemingway wrote that he thought it was a cruel trick. Now, Hemingway was just five years old, mm -hmm. so he had no way of knowing, you know, that this About was death, a cruel yeah. trick. Right. But he believed, but the point is he believed himself to be the descendant of suicidal men on both sides sides of his family, and he predicted his suicide, even rehearsed his suicide. He would, like, for friends in Cuba, he would put his uh, man like her shotgun on the floor and put his big toe in the trigger and put it in the roof of his mouth and go click, you know, and he would grin. Uh, now, why he needed to do that is a whole other <laughs> hour of discussion, but, but you know, he really believed that he was, uh, you know, destined for this. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, it so there's the is genetics in that regard. Yeah. One thing that occurs to me while you're talking about it, and I want to express my appreciation for your sharing that piece of information about practicing, yeah. because this afternoon when I was reading in preparation for our conversation, uh, that was the first time I read about that, that practicing in Cuba and yeah. putting the gun in and, and having a grin after he basically did what he finally did when the gun was loaded. And... Uh, Right. You know, there's a whole thing. Um, I, I I don't know. The the one thing I'm puzzled by is this, um, the business of uh, transcendence, and and what you actually leave behind. You know, the right. the business of what's the document. You know, part of the document is the book, and the narrative and the story. But then I wonder how much of his life was punctuated by that death in his mind as a, right. as a message or as a, as a statement in some way about certain levels of uh, futility and, mm -hmm. uh, and having no answers. I mean, it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of a legacy statement. For one of a better word, I don't. I'm not trying to make it a, a good remark. I'm just talking about what might have been going on in his mind because it has yeah. a narrative quality to it. Right, you nailed it, and I think that um, you know, here's a gentleman who had the Nobel Prize, and he had wealth, and he had fame, and he had younger girlfriends at times, you know, even throughout his marriage and so forth. Marriages, uh, so you know, why would he do this? And I think you're right. It's it's more of the statement, and the more of uh, uh, like he he wrote in in our time about how you know when. It, 
the the phrase of how they won't give you more than you can handle, of course, being God, won't give you more than you can handle, meaning that you would just pass out or something. So something he reflected on his whole life. Uh, Now, he always equated the inability to work with, uh, you know, if he felt he couldn't write, he didn't want to live. He actually made that statement, Mm -hmm. and that was sort of his uh, business to Fitzgerald, was, you know, Zelda's so crazy, she puts you out of business. And I think that the ECT itself propelled that dementia. It accentuated the short-term memory deficits. It it accentuated and propelled them to a level of poor recovery or non-recovery. And he felt at that point that his memory was uh, erased and that Mm -hmm. he had nothing to work with. In fact, the last piece of professional writing he ever did is classic Hemingway. He said, you know, this book, he's talking about movable feast, comes with the remise of my memory and my heart, one of which has been tampered with, the other doesn't exist. Well, you can read it both ways. The memory doesn't exist, the heart's been tampered with, or the heart doesn't exist, the memory's been tampered with. Mm -hmm. But either way, he felt he could not go forward and produce, and that was always what would, you know, mean that he was a useless human being. Uh, So you, you, you once again, uh, pulled that out. And uh, and sadly, you're right. You know, if you think about his life without the suicide, I mean, he just is kind of, you know, one of those iconic figures that just fits with the picture, sad to say, you know, just kind of fits with the picture. And I write in the introduction that, you know, what are the most famous suicides in American history? Marilyn Monroe, mm-hmm. Robin Williams, and Hemingway. <laughs> you know? really? And those are the three. Yeah, those are the three that we that just come to mind if you think about suicides in our, our culture. And you think of the deep interpersonal, uh, intrap- whatever, the, within themselves, pain that they were feeling because oh, yeah. of their limitations... Yeah in terms of who they had become but couldn't continue to evolve further from in some way. I mean, they were they were stuck right. in it. They were in a very, very stuck... You know, I was out there visiting in, in uh, California. We My uh, son and daughter-in-law and their family took my wife and I. We went up to Mammoth and uh, for the last kind of the ski and the snow. And I, I didn't ski myself, but my son took his last... Mm run down the year down mammoth and but we had a great time up there as a family yes but the runoff left the roads odd when you're in owens valley outside of mammoth the surface of the road looks very hard but if you go off the road it's only about three or four inches thick and it's all muck beneath there so you you take yeah. a, you take a a big ram uh, with a camper on back, and you go off there, you're in the mud, and you're really, really stuck. And I think no. when you get stuck like that, and you really don't have recourse, because writing would have been a recourse for right. Marilyn, for Robin, for the creative people, they right. their creativity would be a way to carry on and, and have some other level of um, expression, self-expression, self-understanding. And oh, you're you're right. So they were just lost, and then we we actually had a a truck come out. This is a little too much information for this interesting conversation. No, it's good. It's but good. We had a truck come out from Bishop, which pulled tanks out of ditches. <laughs> it was yeah. an army truck and pulled us out. But we had the truck, thank goodness. We didn't have to live out there in the camper. And and I think you know, metaphorically speaking, that they they were in a serious rut that they saw no way to get out of and 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 that's really too bad because somehow we as professionals need to figure out ways to provide those options and continue to think yeah. about ways that we could walk that extra mile with that person and i think we need to have a specific awareness of celebrity uh, celebrity yeah. stuckness because yes. you know when you reach a certain Uh, level. I was going to use the word grandiosity, but I think that's unfair. Uh, But a a certain level of uh, whatever, collaborative self-realization where you're with a number of people in in a certain other place than you were originally. Right. How how do you maintain that collaborative, entertaining self-realization process? How, how, How can you get past that and and the celebrity is part of the problem 
Oh, you nailed it. I've only had a few celebrity patients, and one of them was a movie producer that actually took me for a ride in his Ferrari. Now, you talk about (laughs) being seduced and losing your clinical judgment. I've never been in a Ferrari before, and, you know, here's this famous guy, you know. So you're absolutely right, and you you nailed it, you know, both with, you know, Williams and Monroe. I mean, clearly these are people who are sort of trapped in the persona and expected to act a certain way, and that what kind of toll does that take on you? And people always say, well, Robin Williams was bipolar. Well, I think that was the shtick because, yeah, he was hypomanic to manic on stage, but when he was doing his role, he was perfectly contained and Mm -hmm. the most controlled actor you ever saw. You know, and so you're absolutely right. You know, it's funny, as you were were saying those beautiful words, I have a a buddy of mine, John Bream, he's a poet, and and his book Help Is On The Way, there's a couple of lines um, that in one of his poems, It's only six lines. It says, to wrap yourself in the perceptions of others and then to enact the emptiness of those perceptions. Even a master illusionist is sometimes taken in by reality, dragged off stage in the mouth of the tiger. You know, and so mm-hmm. I, that's to me is Hemingway, you know, he, yeah. to wrap yourself in the perception of others. You know, sometimes reality will just take over. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. couple. Of, it's, it's a long poem. But those are the most beautiful lines of it. Uh, and you think about, you know, what my argument with Hemingway is, is the persona, even if he wanted to break out of it, this CTE, the form of dementia he had, literally just trapped the worst aspects of that persona. I think for Williams, uh, the the uh, information that he might have had Louis body dementia again, mm-hmm. again trapping the organicity, and of course Monroe. I think she, poor thing. I mean, she was just a uh, a victim of the media, you know. So again, well, I hey. think you nailed it with the whole idea, uh, the persona becoming the person, and in, in, in some of these examples, the the you know the organicity kind of solidified it. Weren't those lovely lines? He's just such oh, a I good. Just, uh, I was so taken with yeah. it. It's like, oh my gosh. We've got to wind up yeah. this conversation. What a great way! Oh. <laughs> what a great way to close. I'm yeah, going to get terrific. that reference actually when I listen to uh, when I prepare the show notes. I'm going Absolutely. to listen to that again and put it in the show notes and put the reference in there. It's just so fantastic. Fantastic. Thank well, you. Yeah. I can't tell you, Andy, how much I've enjoyed this conversation. It's just one of the reasons to have this opportunity to speak to guests is to really be uh, the, have the opportunity to be introduced to really wonderful people like yourself and oh, I can't tell so you how kind. much I know that our audience is going to have a great time with this and I know that your book is going to be phenomenally successful because you not only oh. ro- wrote it very well but you speak about it so eloquently and so interestingly oh. when you put Hemingway in perspective of the times the place the society and the way we were years ago when he when he did pass away so Oh, you're so kind. Of, well, no, I thank you for your work, you know, bringing these things to light. And like I say, you've got so many wonderful podcasts and so much for your listeners to choose from. This is just fantastic. So thank you. Well, I look it's forward terrific. to our next conversation, Andy. We'll, we'll talk yes. about something more conventional, homocysteine. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and we get right down to the biologic basis of something else we could have done if we could have just done a blood draw on Hemingway. Exactly. I, I couldn't have fixed him today, but yeah. uh, just a, a you know a couple of generations too late. <laughs> yeah, right. Doggone it. All right, Andy, we'll sign off. Thank you so much for taking Thank the you. time. I really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for listening to Corbrain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.